Let's see here. For our final time in this playthrough, let's restore our Pokemon to full health. For the final time here, we're restoring our Pokemon to full health. Thank you for waiting. We started Pokemon to full health. Oh, I, I see what you mean. Kuzma, sorry about that. Hope to see you again. I'm doing a PC. Let's see our Pokemon here. Move Pokemon. So yeah, we got our we got our three mythicals. We have well four if you count Manaphy. I guess we could always get Fion by breeding. I don't want to take the time to do that though. So we have the Lord of Jars, we have Sora, we have Monarsis, we have Percy. You can tell that like very different people named a lot of these Pokemon. You can tell with our um final squads here. Ice Ice Baby, Dwayne Johnson, there's Benedict, we got Guzma, that was caught in the Master Ball, Malte, Liberosis, Resolucia, and Avenoir. And then we have this weird duo there. We have Lucatina. Instant win! Your boy Guzma! Glaciavis! Breaking. And there's a there's Cresselia right there. And then what were the uh, other Pokemon that we caught through the journey? Did were there ones? Oh yeah, there was the shiny box. We got Wakargo Mark II. We have Akira over here, we have Pele, we have Plumeria, Nami, and the Lord. These are these are the cute charm glitch shinies that we caught on this adventure, which can technically form like a full team of six. Technically there, isn't that something? So yeah, we have some like why do I have a second lid? When did that happen? Why is that? Weird. But these are our uh Pokemon that we caught throughout the adventure. Someone named that spirit. Most of these I'd say about half of these were named by people in the stream by redeeming name of Pokemon, and half of them were named by me. There's a you, an old Lancer named Lucius. We got this freaking mishmash of a whole bunch of stuff. We got Taco. We got Harold the Chadot. We got I was a numb. Look into my eyes and tell me I haven't seen seen some serious shit. Says that Meryl. We got Muffin. Muffin the Shark. We have Loot. We have fish. We have banana. Banana na na. Get over her. Because there wasn't enough space for get over here for scorpion and stuff. Um, and then we have Fred. We have Fred. And get over her. Instead of a beaver, we have beefer. Is what we got. This whoopers is randomly called Elden Ring. We have Phil. Phil the fish. We have a feared. Real a feared. Ramstein. Atlas. Biba la revo. <laughs> Biba la revolution. Acquire. Acquire the sire. Agent Bead. And a smiley face. We've... We've gotten lots of friends along this journey, to say the least. And who could ever forget our actual party through this journey? We have Voltgeist, the Tactical Refrigerator, Spirit the Lucario, Akira the Crobat, Flareon the Vaporeon, and then our two main dudos, Malus the Torterra and Lin the Staraptor. This is... This is how things were. This was our adventure. You know, I usually don't do things like this, edit in a dedicated discussion into a video after the fact, but I wanted to make sure that I did this right. I have a lot of feelings to share about this game, and what our stance is going to be on the future of covering Pokemon on this channel in general. So I figure while we're doing this discussion, let's just have gameplay over this while I, while I say what I need to say. No dedicated script or anything like that. I just need to, I just need to ramble. If you wonder why I look forward so much, it's because that's still the monitor that is right in front of me and I feel most natural looking at. If you're wondering what I'm watching while I'm, while I'm rambling, it's literally just other gameplay footage from earlier in the series. And uh, th that's what's going on here. <laughs> it's usually during the credits of a game that I'll give my full thoughts, like my full review, what did I think of all the different aspects of it, and really, really close things out. But we don't actually have a, a second round of credits for this game. Like, I guess there technically could if we went and, like, rematched the Elite Four, technically. But otherwise, we're not getting another credit, so we're, we're settling for this. <laughs> I know we got credits before when we like properly beat the game the first time with conquering the Elite Four and the Champion, but I want to have like a final wrap up after we've done like everything. Well, not everything. Like we didn't deck out the Villa. We didn't do all the rivalry matches. We didn't do the Elite Four rematches. 
all the stuff that's not too important or just like harder versions of stuff that we've already done we, we did all the important stuff and this is where we're wrapping up the series okay that that was the point our final episode of pokemon platinum i do have fond memories with pokemon diamond pearl and platinum playing it with people after school and battling trading sometimes even cheating together it was it was honestly good times but as i've mentioned a few times throughout this playthrough I sometimes go back and play games like the older Pokemon Mystery Dungeon games. I have not gone back and played a main series Pokemon game ever since they <laughs> were like replaced with the next game. I've never really gone back to like properly do a playthrough of any previously released main series Pokemon game. I always figure why would I do that when I could play freaking Mystery Dungeon instead, the thing that I love so much more anyway, or, or other games, I guess. I don't know. So. Coming back to this, was it as good as I remember? In some ways, yeah. In some ways, no. It, it was interesting. I do still think it was a great, enjoyable time. Like, I had a good time with this game. Like, I can say that for certain. Like, this is probably one of the most fun playthroughs I've done on this channel in a good while. Like, I originally started this just so that, you know, this playthrough will have recently been done by the time Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl come out, so I have something, like, to compare it to, like, in more recent memory as opposed to, like, a decade ago, and I wasn't sure what I think about it, and I honestly wound up having a lot more fun with this series than I thought I would. I was worried that I might not get too behind it and just get through it for the sake of comparisons purposes, but no, I actually had fun. But there were also a lot of things we're coming back to it after a decade. It's like, oh, how is that not a thing in this game? Or why is that the way it is? Like, for example, take menu navigation. If you're in like, one of the menus in your bag and you're at like the very top, you can't press up to like cycle to the bottom. If you're at the bottom, you can't press down to cycle to the top. There's no, it doesn't loop. It does not do that. And as far as I could tell, and there was no sort button in the inventory either. So unless I'm just a complete idiot and didn't see it, which honestly, there's probably a decent chance of. <laughs> I was just like, what the hell is this item navigation all the time whenever I was navigating my bag? Or take, for example, the way these games handle fire types, which I didn't even realize was an issue until I started doing this playthrough and people were telling me about it. So I believe the only fire types available in a time of pro platinum is... The ponytail line, the magmar line, uh, the handower line, and like the starters with chimchar. And that, that's it for fire types. So you're probably not going to be having a fire type on your playthrough or like a pretty good fire type move in general. And that could be problematic against opponents like the bronzors and bronzongs were that were like the most annoying things for me to deal with. Because apparently steel resists dark in these games for whatever wacky reason so you can't use a dark type attack to be super effective you can't use fighting against the steel to be super effective because that's a uh, that's gonna be resisted by the psychic type you can't use ground type moves because of levitate you can probably use ghost type moves unless steel resists that too i don't remember but like the one super reliable thing to use against them was freaking fire type moves and they were tanky as heck i hated dealing with the bronzors and bronzongs in this game i never thought i would despise seeing like one pokemon line as my opponent so much in a playthrough of pokemon and there are also like a lot of problems that like modern pokemon games have shifted away from like hms for example i really don't like hms <laughs> The fact that you have to pretty much screw one of your Pokemon's moves, unless it's a good move like Surf or Fly or whatever the heck, just so that you can be able to progress in certain environments, or maybe swap out your team if you want to have somebody there who you're willing to waste the move slots for. It's just... I was so glad after Gen 7, I believe it was, shifted away from HMs, what, the, what with the ride Pokemon that were introduced. If, if Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl bring back HMs, I'm actually going to be so mad. And same with Roaming Legendaries. I... The Roaming Legendaries was like six or something episodes. And in real time, it took me like four hours or something like that. It was... It was painful. I really didn't like it. Or take even other littler things like... Freaking buying Pokeballs at the shop where for every 10 you buy, you get a Premier Ball. At least that's the way it is in newer games. Whereas in this game, it's like you buy over 10 Pokeballs, you get a Premier Ball. So the best bang for your buck is to keep buying them in sets of 10. You can't buy like 100 all at once and get a free Premier Ball. So to say that this was a perfect experience to me would be lying. But 
I actually really enjoyed this, I'm gonna be honest. Yes, there were some really weird issues like that, but I generally really enjoyed it. This was a, this was a good time. Like I said, these were the games that I started with, so I don't know exactly all the advancements that were made over the uh, Gen 3 games in terms of having experienced the difference myself. But I do like how there were additions, like when a Pokemon comes out, it'll move a smidge, like there's an animation there. It was even cooler when Black and White came out, and there was like full moving sprites in battles. That was so cool. When that came out, I thought that was like the most revolutionary cool thing ever back then. But yes, I really enjoyed this game. And I guess we'll go through the through the various aspects. Let's start out with gameplay. Something that I really liked about the gameplay back when I first played this, and this was my introduction into freaking JRPGs in general, never mind Pokemon. I I found the world really fascinating. The way that, you know, you had a vast region ahead, but there was still a linear story and things going on, and you had to figure out, like, okay, where can I go from here? What did I just unlock that unlocked something else somewhere else? Unless it's HMs, which is just annoying. But you know what I mean. I got, like, the next gym badge, and it's like, where can I go from here? I can explore a little bit in all these different directions, but I might not be able to do this until until later. And that's kind of been something that I've been enjoying about Metroid games uh, lately that we've been covering on the channel. Like, I feel like there's a right and wrong way to handle stuff that you can't quite get to yet. Like, for example, there's a whole bunch of Zelda games where I won't like the dungeons of them. Because a lot of Zelda dungeons, to me, will oftentimes just feel like, uh, time to go through checking all the rooms until I eventually find the item somewhere in the dungeon. And then when I've got the item, I gotta go around to all the places I've already been and figure out where the heck can I use that item that I just got until I eventually get to the end. But the way that it's been handled in the Metroid games that I've played so far on this channel is like, you're exploring around seeing all these different rooms and there's like super clear icons for everything. And maybe there was in Zelda games as well and I was just too young to pay attention or something like that. I, I wouldn't be surprised. But there's clear icons for these kinds of things. So when I get a certain power up and it clearly matches with a certain thing, it's like, oh, I can go do the thing in that place. And that's the kind of thing that I found when I was exploring around the world in this game when I was first playing it back in the day. Like, oh, I start going to Candleave City, but there's water in the way. Oh, but there's not like there's nothing to do here. Somebody gives me a fishing rod and I can go fishing and I enjoy that for a little bit. And then sometime down the line, I get a, I get an HM, even though I hate HMs, but I unlock the ability to uh, surf on water. And it's like, wait, can I go to that place and go across the thing? And I go there and I go across the thing. And it's like, whoa, I could go to this new city here, Candleave City, stuff like that. I found it really fascinating as a, as a kiddo, that kind of stance on a, on a world. And I think that there are good and bad ways to do it. Like, not every instance of it was perfect in this kind of game. But I did find it fascinating how there are paths all over the place and I was figuring out where do I go from here. I found it a lot more fascinating as a kid than I do nowadays as an adult, but there is still, there is still that kind of fascination of where do I go from here. Back when the, back when the games were these much more diverse, all over the place kind of routes where it's like, okay, where do I go from here? As opposed to more modern games where it's just like, okay, just go in a straight line this way. I don't mind linear games, but there is also something to be said about like the magic that can come with exploring a world where it's like, okay, where do I go from here? You know, as long as it's not done in a, in a annoying kind of way, like some games do. <laughs> In terms of gameplay, do I think this game has aged well compared to modern standards? Eh, it's not bad. It's, it's not bad. And it's not, you know... But it's not like coming back to this, I was one of those people that's of the kind of opinion that's like, Oh my goodness, this is so much better than the newest stuff that we've gotten, like, every way imaginable. Cause it's not. It's not at the end of the day. There is something to be said for coming back to this and having a having a look at it like some of its dayness does show here and there but it is still a fascinating experience and really makes me recall like you know how breathtaking this was for the time it's kind of like there was a game that i recently played on the channel like earlier this year called tales of asperia i've never played a tales game before and it was something that was requested to me by one of my mods and it was a 2008 jrpg there were a lot of stresses that i had along along the way with that game but I'm still glad that I saw it through to the end because it helped me understand how influential that was for the time. 
and how much of an impact it had on various other other JRPGs out there. So from that standpoint, putting myself into the mindset of the time period, it was really fascinating. And that's kind of how I feel about Pokemon Platinum in a way, where, you know, playing it in modern times, it's not going to be like a perfect game where it's like, oh my goodness, this is still just as breathtaking as it was then. I don't think it's going to be that, but you know, considering considering the time period, it's it is fascinating. It is fascinating to look at again, and still a great, enjoyable experience to have. I still really enjoyed it. Whenever I give full reviews of games, I always talk about them in like the aspects of gameplay, story, music, and art style. Let's talk about art style next. How about I generally really like the like the looks of these games, the world, the the sprite work, the characters. It's all really beautiful, clean kind of stuff. And I think that this kind of an art style really worked for like the Nintendo DS and what that console could handle. Does this same exact art style work on the Nintendo Switch? Make of it what you will. Make of it what you will, I guess. <laughs> but playing this, I couldn't help but find this game just very charming, quite frankly, at every, at every twist and turn. Okay, maybe not every twist and turn, but a lot of twists and turns. <laughs> The sprite work of these kinds of games is the kind of thing that'll still age well. Like, there are parts of this game that have not exactly aged too well. Like the, uh, like some of the weird UI things, like not being able to cycle in menus, or, uh, the lack of fire types, or other weird, strange things about this game. There are definitely some things that haven't aged well, but I feel like the sprite work is something that has aged well. Like, typically when it comes to video games, if you go for, like, a cartoony art style, it'll age well. If you go for, like, a super realistic art style, it, it's not gonna age well. Like, one of the games that we've covered on this channel before is the old Sly Cooper games, for example, where those are PS2 games, but they still look like they've aged well because it went for a cartoony kind of art style. But you get, like, these old PS2, PS1 kind of games that try to get, like, the most realistic looking characters they can. That does not age well. And I feel like that's also especially the case for when you do like charming sprite work in terms of it in terms of it aging well. Like, there are some old games that, you know, if they go for certain art styles, it just hurts to play them in modern times. But there's a reason that a lot of indie games go for nice charming sprite work. Because it's something that's like nostalgic, even if you haven't played those games specifically. Like when I played Octopath Traveler, for example. Which was the only time I've ever played Octopath Traveler is when I did the playthrough of it on this channel. That game felt nostalgic, even, like, on my first and only playthrough that I've done of it. Its world felt so nostalgic, despite it being the first time I was in that world. Just because there's something so charming and nostalgic about, like, nice, clean sprite work. So, that's something that I feel like has aged well in these games. <laughs> like, some of the- some of the gameplay snusk might not have. But the art style definitely has, in my opinion. But. No, maybe I should just make sure that I'm prefacing this, saying that this is all my opinion and that you're, you're entitled to your own. I've had some comments on some videos that get like really, really mad at me because I didn't explicitly say it's my opinion. You should probably be able to guess this is my opinion, by the way, in case you didn't know. Next up, let's talk about the story. A good story in a video game can be a very, very fascinating thing because no other form of media has a story that's driven forward through the actions of the player, and I find that very fascinating. Pokemon's stories have never exactly been known to be exceptional, unless your name is Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. But apart from that, there haven't really been any main series games that have like really experimented and tried something different or more risky with its story, something deeper, apart from Pokemon Black and White. That game is really, really cool. Like using Pokemon Black and White as an example for storytelling, that game was very fascinating in that it had a main antagonist that never truly felt like an evil person. His motivations were believable, he was very humanized, to the point that one of the legendary dragons joined him of their own volition, which is really, really cool and you never see happening in like any other Pokemon games. And one of the reasons why I feel like Pokemon games plots are often very simple is because you have a silent protagonist who's not developing in any way whatsoever. Like, silent protagonists can develop in games like Legend of Zelda or Metroid games, for example, depending depending on the game. But Pokemon games will always have this silent protagonist that really doesn't grow in any way. Maybe you grow as the player as you go through it if you want to look at it in a symbolic way, but you don't actually see the character 
growing. And that was the fascinating thing about Pokemon Black and White, is that N is a character that you see throughout the plot and is growing and developing in fascinating ways, to the point that I would argue that N is the main character of Pokemon Black and White. It's kind of like how I argue that in Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild and Age of Calamity, Zelda is the main character while Link is the main supporting character, because Link doesn't change. That's what his character is. He's, he's the boy that'll always tackle whatever challenge, no matter how difficult it is, and that's what his character is. They literally call him out as that in Age of Calamity, that that's the way that he's always been. But Zelda is the character that like, grows and develops throughout the plot and comes to terms with the fact that, you know, the progress of others around her doesn't necessarily mean these are the same expectations for her own progress, that her own success or failures isn't determined by others around her. Like, it's fascinating when we have games like this that have a silent protagonist, but will still have development elsewhere if you're not going to have it in your actual playable character. Pokemon Diamond Pearl Platinum? We don't really have any characters develop, really. Nothing really changes. Like, again, you could look at it in a symbolic way, where it's like you as the player grow as the journey goes on. Like, Pokemon is, in a way, a story of finding your own strength in the world. Like, a child, a child growing up and finding their own identity, in a way. You could look at it in a symbolic way. But, in the actual main story being told, you don't really see any development in something like Diamond Pearl Platinum. And you don't really have, like, humanized villains either. Like, there's Team Galactic that wants to destroy the universe and make a new one. Why? Why do they want to destroy this universe? Did somebody leave them a bad tip at their, at their last job, and now they're pissed off? Did somebody say something mean to them on Twitter? Or <laughs> what's going on here? What happened that made them, and especially Cyrus, want to destroy the universe and make a new one? Is it just a generic evil character kind of thing where it's like, I want to be the ruler of a world, so I'll make a new one where I'm the ruler of it? In which case, why would anybody else follow him? Like, why would anybody follow this person that wants to rule and take everything over and be in charge and all that fun stuff unless they actually had, like, believable convictions and believable things that they're going to do in a world that you'd like to see? That's why freaking people follow powerful figures all the time throughout history is because they genuinely believe hey this person's gonna make some changes that i'd like to see but none of that's ever shared so <laughs> does cyrus have believable convictions is the world that he makes really gonna be better he says that it will does but in what way <laughs> not too dissimilar from some politicians in our own world but yeah, the villains are not humanized, they're not believable. I think as we were doing this playthrough, there was actually a bit where the game joked about that, where we were in, like, the Team Galactic HQ, and I think one of the grunts was joking about, like, blindly following orders and not questioning anything, like, that's the rule. They were making some sort of a, some sort of a joke about it. Some sort of a joke about the absurdity of their own plot that I thought was, that I thought was pretty good. But yeah, so the plot... It's something that, like, you can see through to the end and see what happens. It'll get you intrigued with the lore, at least. I do think in terms of storytelling, the lore is very fascinating. What with the situation with the legendaries of space, time, and the distortion world, the lake trio that helps keep them in check, all that stuff. I think that there's a very fascinating lore, and the story can be interesting to go to to learn a bit more about that lore and what these, what these creatures are and how they relate to one another and such. But in terms of, like, the actual main plot that's telling outside of the lore, it's just like, okay, well, here's insert generic game plot 101. And that's something that the entire Pokemon series could, uh, could better in general, in my opinion. Like, look at something like the plot of Sword and Shield, for example, which I feel like is one of the best examples of a plot where it's like, it could have been good, but it's not, because you never really know what's going on. Like, why is Chairman Rose causing the darkest day going to be like the solution to some future energy crisis or something like that why is causing this apocalyptic event going to solve that does it release a lot of energy are you going to capture all of it and then we're going to be good on like battery power for a long time it's never really mentioned is it now <laughs> take the plot of sun and moon which is another another game that had like a very fascinating lore but might have might have missed some of the mark with its uh with its story. I found it actually pretty decently fascinating, but I felt like I never really understood why Luzamine was a psycho bitch. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I felt like it wasn't properly explained. I've mentioned this on stream before, and some people have corrected me saying that, like, Niheligo corrupted her, and it's like, oh, okay, well, there's a reason, I guess, but, like, why? 
How did that ha When did that happen? Was that from like all the experiments with the wormholes and stuff? Why did it corrupt her? Is that just a thing that Yelligo do naturally? I don't, I don't know. It's like one of those plots where it's like, things work out perfectly in this specific way, just so we can tell the plot in this specific way. No other, no other reason. Pokemon X and Y, I felt like could have had like a really good plot as well, but kind of, kind of missed its mark. Like again, a fascinating lore with like AZ and Floet and this like ancient weapon laser thing. But why, why did Team Flare want to use it? I actually don't remember. Were they just like, yeah, let, let's go firing our laser or something like that? Like I, I never, I never quite got it. I feel like the problem with plots in main series Pokemon games in general is that they have like some fascinating lore and you know, a team of villains that could be very fascinating, but they're never like properly flushed out or explained. And it just leaves you feeling like, Okay, there was that, I guess. So that's not a complaint specifically with like Pokemon Platinum. That's just that's just how I feel about stories in main series Pokemon games in general, unless its name is black and white. Like they even they even kind of threw some stuff away with a uh, black to white too in terms of like really intriguing and believable kind of storytelling. Like I think I don't remember the exact plot of black to white too, but wasn't Getsis just trying to freeze the region because he was pissed as hell? <laughs> wasn't that what was happening? Anyway, Pokemon plot. I feel like Pokemon is one of those series that in general has very fascinating lore, but it doesn't do enough with it in its main storytelling. And that's kind of the way that I felt about games like Fire Emblem Three Houses. Like Fire Emblem Three Houses has like one of the most flushed out history and lores I've seen in like any game. The problem is it doesn't really use all that much of it in its main storytelling. Like it uses smidges here and there, but it usually doesn't really come to play in any significant kind of way. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. And I feel like that might be the same kind of situation with like Pokemon in general, where there's like this super deep lore, but it's not really used as much as it could be in the in the main storytelling. And if it was used more in the main storytelling, that could make for a very fascinating plot because the lore is very fascinating. Anyway, yeah, that's my that's my discussions about the about the plot. And then the music. My goodness gracious. Generation 4 music is special to a lot of people for a reason, for a very good reason, especially the route themes. Like, my goodness, when the music can, like, build the world around you is one thing, but when the music takes you on, like, an adventure all on its own is a whole, is a whole nother thing. And, I mean, there's a time and place for both kinds of styles, depending on what feel you're gonna want to go for. Like, take area themes in something like Octopath Traveler, for example. They're going to be, like, very, very relaxing kind of themes that make you feel like you're there in the world, and that's what they aim for. Whereas something like the music of something like Pokemon Diamond Pearl Platinum is going to make you feel like you're going on an adventure, and this is the feeling of your story unfolding, in a way. Like, they have vastly different feels, but they both achieve their both achieve that desired purpose. Or you can just play a game like Breath of the Wild and just not do music. <laughs> but again, when I started this playthrough, it was for comparisons purposes to Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl when they came out. I played this being like, okay, let's get a playthrough of this done, and then I'll be able to more accurately compare this to Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl when they're out. I didn't know how much it was really going to draw me in here, but my goodness, when I started hearing some of the music, oh my goodness, the music was incredible. And I've listened to a lot of remixes from a lot of different remixers from a lot of themes from Pokemon and Gen 4 the most. Like anybody that's looked over the uh, music playlist that I have in my channel, I always add music that I enjoy to like the stream music playlist whenever I enjoy it for anybody to like browse through if they ever want to see some good music. And I have a separate playlist for remixes of each Pokemon generation and Gen 4 is the longest. Like it's very, very popular out there. So when it came to me playing this game, just purely for uh, comparisons purposes, like whatever, let's get a playthrough done and then I'll be able to like see how much is really changed with Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl compared to Platinum. I was listening to some of the music and despite the fact that I've heard all these remixes over the course of years, it was just something about listening back to the originals that I haven't heard in like the past decade and being like, whoa, that's really something there, isn't it? Especially about themes that I hadn't heard remixed as much, like Route 203. I don't see a lot of remixes about that. When when that theme started hitting hard, I remember in the middle of that episode, I just needed to stop and like, just listen to it. Just take it in like, whoa, that's, 
that's really something there, isn't it? Or I think it was in the middle of like either the first or the second session when I first got the fishing rod and I was out by that uh, pier leading to Candleleaf City that I couldn't go to yet because I didn't have surf yet. And I was just listening to the music. I was like, I can really understand how I could just sit here, just keep on fishing, listening to the music and just watch the time go by. Like one of those, one of those experiences that you can just get yourself lost in, you know, is what is what it was like of course i didn't want to stick around there too long because i was also you know doing a playthrough and trying to be an entertaining content creator and all that fun stuff but it was still very tempting to just sit there pretend that i'm not streaming pretend that i'm not making a series on this just don't say anything just sit back and, and just enjoy it you know is there was a few times that i was kind of tempted to tempted to do that it was fascinating and unexpected, is how I can put it. But yeah, so at the end of the day, when it comes to my thoughts on Pokemon Platinum here, I do think that it's a great and enjoyable game. I do think that it's a great time. I don't think that it's perfect. I don't think it's aged perfectly. I do think that some of its age shows. But I think even looking back at it today, it's kind of like Tales of Asperia was for me, where it's like, there will be some frustrations along the lines, like stuff that I don't remember happening back in the back in the day when I wouldn't pay as attention, as much attention as a kiddo, but nowadays I know as, a, as an adult. Like, there are some hiccups here and there, but it's still a fascinating thing to experience, especially putting into the context of the time and being like, whoa, that's that, you know? Oh, I should also say, screw third versions. Like, could have just delayed Pokemon Diamond and Pearl by like a year and put in all the additional content from Platinum into Diamond and Pearl. Why is it that Pokemon and like a few other series is like, I hear that Persona apparently does it as well, release enhanced versions later. Why did, why did they get away with that? That's not okay. They've been doing it for a, a very long time. Nowadays, it might be freaking DLC instead of a instead of a third game, but it's still content where it's like, okay, this could have been there. Like, I usually don't mind DLC in games if it's handled in a way where it's like, okay, this really is additional stuff there. And it did feel that way in Sword and Shield, but at the same time, Sword and Shield was like the one main series Pokemon game that really didn't have a post game. Unless you counted being behind a paywall, and that's a little bit iffy. So, I don't like the whole Pokemon stance throughout the entire time that Pokemon's been a thing. Of release an enhanced third version a year or two later to get people to buy the same game again. Or, uh, freaking Sword and Shield stance of, like, who needs post-game when we can make money, you know? So, I don't think that... Pokemon has ever exactly been angelic in terms of how they <laughs> how they handle additional content for their games. So that's something a little bit uh, a little bit off putting. And I feel like that's the reason why I didn't really get into Platinum all that much back in the day. Like I played the shit out of Diamond and Pearl, like mostly Diamond version. And yeah, I got like Pearl way later because I was freaking out of my mind. <laughs> But I put a lot of time into those games. But then when Platinum came out and I played that, I I don't even think I beat it, honestly. I don't think I beat it. <laughs> like, I put some time into it, but I don't think I ever beat it. I was just like, yeah, this is just like the game that I played before, you know? I wasn't really, I wasn't really that into it. But then I got really into Heart Gold and Soul Silver, and those are very long games as well. Like, we'll cover them on the channel eventually, but my goodness, I have to be prepared to buckle up for a even longer series than this one. And this one was 100 episodes, so, <laughs> no, I gotta really buckle up for, buckle up for that. It'll happen eventually, but, you know. And then there was Black and White, and Black 2, White 2. Why couldn't the Pokemon series have more sequels like Black 2, White 2? I was critiquing its story not being that good earlier this stream, but it was still cool to be like a sequel and have like new areas, new capturable Pokemon and all that stuff rather than just like, here's the exact same game with like some new modes and like some other capturable Pokemon and all that fun stuff there. And then there was X and Y, and there was planned to be a Z version seemingly, but there never was, and Zygarde was just left as like, the most not flushed out third of like a legendary trio ever in the Pokemon series. Poor Zygarde. And it went straight to Omega Ruby Alpha Sapphire and then to Sun and Moon. And with Ultra Sun and Moon, that was basically like the equivalent of a third version, except it was two versions rather than a singular third version. But it's still the equivalent of like the enhanced third version later with like some story differences and other some other changes. 
It had been a long time between Platinum and Ultra Sun and Moon. It really took playing Ultra Sun and Moon for me to be like, wow, this is the exact same thing that I played before. Why why am I playing this? I already paid for and played this game. What the what the hell? But yeah, Pokemon has always been stingy with like its additional versions. Like there was Platinum as the last like third enhanced version, like as officially just a third. There was a big break in the middle and I was a kiddo when Platinum when Platinum came out. And then Ultra Sun Moon was where I was like, oh, yeah, th this is a bit silly, isn't it? Instead of just having this stuff in like the original game, like delaying it a bit. But I guess maybe that <laughs> that helps out with them being the world's largest crossing media IP, I guess. When it comes to Pokemon games in the Pokemon series, I don't mind two versions. That's how, like, that's one of the reasons why Pokemon became the largest crossing media IP, by bringing people together to like trade for exclusives and stuff like that. I find that very fascinating. But I don't like enhanced third versions. I don't like when, so I don't like Platinum just being an enhanced third version instead of that stuff being in Diamond and Pearl. So that's something I'll judge Platinum for. I don't like post game being behind a paywall like it was in, like it was in Sword and Shield. Basically, I don't like those kinds of experiences when it comes to IPs in general. I like paying for a game and then I've got that game and that's all the features that are going to be there. And if there is DLC, it really is going to be something vastly different. Like Sword and Shield's DLC is vastly different. My criticism is that there's no real post game outside of that. DLC's got to be something vastly different and add something really new to the mix. I do worry about Pokemon potentially embracing a games as a service model. Like... I worry with Legends Arceus that there's going to be like a limited dex at launch and then as the years go on, it, or as at least like a year goes on, they're going to add more and like bits and pieces with like additional patches rather than taking the time to release everything straight up. I really don't like the model of like games as a service in general and Pokemon has kind of always been embracing that in a way with like enhanced third versions that I won't like Platinum for that reason, but now we see them embracing it in like the more, you know, market accepted kind of way as modern games are nowadays but in a way we've kind of always seen pokemon embrace this kind of this kind of stance of you know release more down the line that's more of the same kind of experience so while i do like praising pokemon platinum a whole lot i will judge it in the regard that this could have been additional content in diamond and pearl if they had taken longer with it you know and you can say that about a lot of pokemon games but but there's that. At the end of the day, I did back then, and I do now, really enjoy Pokemon Platinum. It's not perfect, but it was a really good enjoyable time, and probably some of the most fun that I've had with a playthrough on this, on this channel in a while. And had some of the best reception as well. Like, there's been a lot of people who have really enjoyed this series, and that's really, that's really warmed my heart, because I'm just, uh... I'm just a long-haired weirdo that's making videos on the interwebs. So the fact that anybody gets entertained by them, never mind, is like willing to commit to a 100 episode series is just mind-blowing to me. So, you know, in that shame in part, when I was saying that I had gratitude to the community, I really meant it. Like this, none of this would be possible without, without y'all out there who are giving me the inspiration to keep doing what I'm doing. I am definitely going to miss this playthrough. I had a good time with it. On one hand, it is nice that it's finally like wrapped up and finished off, but at the same time, it's a little bit painful to see it go in a way. Like, because we've been developing it for what? This year's been going on, on and off for like over half a year now. That's crazy to think about, you know? Like, this has been one of the longer playthroughs we've done on this channel in terms of both the number of episodes made and like the real lifetime span that it took place in, you know? But there is also one big thing that I want to discuss here, and that's what does the future of Pokemon on this channel look like? And the answer to that question is I'm honestly not 100% certain. Because while Pokemon has been known to be a series that brings people together, like, heck, even my mom playing Pokemon Go at work will go down to like a raid battle and there will be people from other buildings on this university campus that come and are playing Pokemon Go as well and that's how a lot of them have networked and got to know one another like Pokemon has always brought a lot of people together but on the world of the internet it seems to like really really divide like there was my video essay criticizing the modern business stances of Pokemon and the reception of that video has been 
mostly positive, but it's gotten so much reception that those that are negative is still like a significant number of people and a lot of people who have made it like very, very known to me how much they hate my guts. And I find that very jarring in a way that, you know, opinions on a series of children slash family games can get you thrown in the hot seat and treated like your opinions don't mean anything at all, you know? Like again, it's been mostly positive, but I'd be lying if I said I wasn't getting daily comments for a good while from people hating my guts. Nowadays, it's closer to once a week. It's died down a little bit, but my plan with Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl was to do it as a YouTube stream, try out YouTube streaming. I do like a stream of one on Twitch and another one on YouTube and see which one I prefer the live streaming of and maybe it'll help me come closer to the answer of whether I want to do less Twitch streaming and more YouTube streaming. We'll, we'll see. But I worry with that kind of format that, you know, how is that going to be received is, is a worry because the internet's a weird place and this is something that we've been discussing during some other playthroughs on this channel recently. The internet in general can bring people more together than history has ever seen before, but at the same time it can also serve to divide people more, because platforms like YouTube, Google, freaking any social media platform, they're going to be making the most profit off of collecting the most information off of you and the most retention time if they're showing you things like ads. So naturally, they want to be showing you the things that they think is going to result in the most retention time, which means they show you a lot of things that you already agree with, rather than a lot of different viewpoints. What this means when you get shown the exact same viewpoint over and over again, is you start to believe that one more, and even more so like any other opinion must be like this most crazy unheard of thing that like how could anybody believe that because you've never seen anybody else mention anything about that. So when you eventually have like the quote unquote wrong content recommended to you, that's something that's like disagreed with. A lot of people will see that as like the most crazy outlandish thing that how could anybody think that? Because that's not the kind of thing that they're exposed to. And this isn't just a thing with like Pokemon. Like in the grand scheme of things, something like Pokemon doesn't matter. It's a series of games that we can enjoy, but it's really not like a big important thing in the world unless you account for like its economic impacts I guess but I, what I mean is there's plenty of aspects in life where it does matter like deep political issues where people who are of a certain political viewpoint will see more of that and almost none of the other stance and same for vice versa and you have people like dead set in these kinds of mindsets that kind of prevents the world from growing in a way but it feels like Pokemon has just naturally become like a battleground of debate where it's like what does it what does it really matter it's it's a series of video games like why is there such a deep reason to prove that you know anybody is absolutely right or absolutely wrong like I don't like either side of the spectrum for like either argument if it's too an extreme like I'll see people in the comments of that one video who hate my guts and anybody who agrees with me because of because of our opinions i'll see people in the comments of that video who are putting me up on like some pedestal and i am the absolute right and anybody else who says otherwise is absolutely wrong get the hell out of here your opinions mean nothing both those sides of the spectrum are so toxic and i really wish that that was the kind of thing that we didn't see as much on the on the internet as we do i feel like part of the reason of being exposed to all sorts of different creators and personalities out there, whether it be on the internet or even in real life through like the different teachers that you have teaching you, is to understand like all these different viewpoints and arguments and use them to form your own opinion. Like you don't need to blindly accept anything that like I or any other YouTuber or anybody else that preaches any argument has to say, but rather, you know, consider it and make your own opinion out of it. But I just find that like a lot of the Pokemon community is not very good at doing that and it like really puts me off a lot of the time like it can make me feel very uncomfortable when i want to just go about my go about my day enjoy myself share either my opinions or what i'm passionate about and some people will just treat it like i am the stupidest person who ever lived 
Like, I don't mind people disagreeing with me. I welcome it. There have been plenty of people that I've talked to about that video essay or other stances on Pokemon or even plenty of other subjects where it's like, we'll disagree with one another, but we'll hear one another out and be like, okay, that's a very interesting argument you're making there. And I see why you understand it. I might disagree with some of your claims. Like, I don't think these arguments quite equate to the claims that you're making, but you know, you've got me thinking here, you know, and have like a respectful, a respectful kind of discussion. But because of the whole nature of the, uh, the internet with the whole, you know, platforms are always recommending to you what you agree with and rarely what you disagree with. It makes the things that you disagree with seem like these blatantly wrong things where there can't be any other way of seeing things. And you just have to let that creator know it's, uh, it's not the best of environments. And I'm not sure if it's something that I feel comfortable being around if it does wind up being the kind of thing that I'd regularly see if I do say a YouTube live stream of Brilliant Diamond or Shining Pearl to the point that my current stance is like I'll start it I, I'll start a playthrough on it but if there is a lot of that kind of thing I I might not be able to continue because I can say it right now I will have negative things to say about that game I'll also have plenty of positive things to say about that game it's not like it's gonna be completely either way but no matter what you say about, like, anything, it, when, if it has to do with Pokemon, people are, there's gonna be some people that hate you for it. And in case you're wondering why this is a pre-recorded and edited thing in at the end, rather than just a, you know, unedited ramble at the end of this session, it's because that was originally the plan. And that is actually exactly what I did. But, as I was saying, anytime you say anything about something like Pokemon, there will always be somebody who thinks that you're like the stupidest person ever for thinking such a thing. You want to know what I said during my ramble in the Pokemon Platinum stream that started drama? I said the music is good. I said I enjoyed the music. It's good. That was apparently the super blasphemous thing that was met with the response that I would lose that argument. <laughs> There's no way that I could argue for that. And... And this kind of reaction to, you know, me trying to, you know, express my feelings and passions at the end of this 100 part series to be met with that. It was very off putting and hard for me to keep track of my thoughts from that point onward because it was like I was put on the spot in the hot seat when I'm trying to wrap things up there. And I worry about stuff like that happening in a stuff like continuing main series Pokemon on this channel, especially if I do it through live streams, is like, hey, I just, I'm open to other opinions, but when it's like phrased in such a way at such a time, it's like, okay. <laughs> I worry that there'll be instances like that of people who come in just to be condescending and disagree. And I've seen all the time in YouTube comments. I see it sometimes on my stream. I've had some people reach out to me on Twitter to tell me about how wrong I am about Pokemon and like how freaking anybody who thinks that must be like the stupidest person ever and i'm gonna be honest i'm a i am a sensitive person at the end of the day and i don't know if it's the kind of thing that i can deal with on a on a regular basis some people can i don't know if i'm if i'm one of them like the the places that we've gone with pokemon in the past year have kind of put that to the test and i'm in a weird state right now where I've been debating about if I even just wanted to drop covering main series Pokemon on the channel at all anymore. So my current plan is still cover Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl, cover Legends Arceus, but if it does become like an overwhelming tidal wave of those who believe it's blasphemous to have any opinion, no matter what the heck it is, then I don't know if that's the kind of environment that I want to stick around in and I might wind up sticking around with some other games a bit more, a bit more frequently. So that's what, that's what's been keeping me up at nights lately thinking about essentially. So I guess the biggest thing that I want to express is just the importance of respecting other opinions, you know? Being able to have the strength and mental fortitude to be able to say like, hey, I disagree, but you've got your own arguments, some of which I may agree with, some of which I may disagree with, and you have your own reasons for for believing what you believe. That doesn't make you less of a person or have less of an opinion. We all have our own opinion, you know? Like when I see people in places like comments or Twitter that 
absolutely hate me and anyone who sides with me because of opinions. Or I see in those same places people who do side with me, but hate anybody who disagrees. That's really not the kind of environment that I want. It's, I, I don't want a battleground, you know? And I don't think that either side taking such a radical stance of like, this is absolute right, this is absolute wrong, in either way, is healthy. I don't think I'm absolutely in the right about my opinions. Like, no one, no one is perfect. I have my reasons for believing the things that I do, and I like taking the time to be able to express those, but I don't have the expectation that everybody has to believe what I'm saying, or else they're wrong, you know? Like, I myself am pretty pessimistic about Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, and uh, Legends Arceus, but I've had people talk to me in the Discord server, or even in DMs in some cases, about how they're really looking forward to it, and they're excited for it. And I'll say like, hey, I'm glad to hear that you're excited for it, I might not be myself, but, you know, I'm glad to see some people excited for it, and, you know, that's, it's your own right to enjoy what you want to enjoy. Like, I've had some questions on some of my videos be things like, is it shameful to like the new Pokemon games? It's like, what? Of course not. What, where did you get that from? Yeah, there's some pretty shitty business practices, but if you still enjoy things, all things considered, that's your right to enjoy it. Like, I'll see some comments on some of my videos blaming all the people reading that comment for buying the games like they're the ones at fault for having this all be possible. Like, Pokemon is in such a unique position as an IP, as the world's largest crossing media IP. It's a household name. Everybody knows somebody who's into Pokemon. So when somebody sees Pokemon on the shelf, they'll have probably heard of it before, or they'll know somebody who's really into it. And it's like, oh, maybe this is my chance to try it out and see what all the hubbub is about. Like I had friends in elementary school who were playing the generation four games with me, but didn't play after that. And are nowadays picking up Nintendo Switches and see things like Sword and Shield. And they're like, man, I haven't played Pokemon in so long. Maybe this is my chance to get back into it without knowing any of the drama surrounding it or anything like that. Or there was Pokemon Go's launch, where so many people got into that because so many people had heard about, you know, somebody who's into Pokemon or heard the name around. Like, my mom got into Pokemon because it's an IP that I'm passionate about. And she plays Pokemon Go to this day on that trek to level 50 that was apparently added, like, however long ago now. I, I lose track of things. I don't play Pokemon Go myself, but she does all the time. It's one of those names where if everybody watching videos like mine or everybody that has any opinion on Pokemon that they share on a place like Twitter. If every single one of those people stopped buying, it would have dent in their sales, sure, but it would still easily be profitable. So it's nobody's fault that things are the way that they are. I feel like Pokemon's at the point where it's like, enjoy it or don't, it's up to you, but it's not anybody's fault. Like, it's not the fault of people enjoying it that the people who don't enjoy it, don't enjoy it. Like, it's there's nobody at fault here. It's just in that unique kind of position where that, none of those things matter. Okay, I take it back. There's two takeaways, not just one. Be respectful of other opinions. And two, enjoy what you want to enjoy. As long as it's not hurting like yourself or others or the world or anything like that, enjoy what you want to enjoy. Some people might bash you for enjoying or not enjoying certain things. Like, I know that there's a lot of people that hate me for my critical takes on Breath of the Wild, for example. But at the end of the day, you are who you are. You enjoy what you want to enjoy. And nobody else should have the right to dictate that over you. Like, I have pessimistic opinions of Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl and Legends Arceus. That doesn't mean you're not allowed to enjoy it. Like, if you're hyped for it, be hyped! Be hyped! And I hope you get a lot of fun out of those games. And if you're not hyped and want to look at it in a more critical and pessimistic kind of way, well, hey, maybe we can have a look at it together and, you know, share some, share some criticisms. But none of these things mean that anybody has to treat anything a certain way. There are always going to be people in life that try to get you to conform to whatever way of thinking they think would be better for you to conform to. But at the end of the day, you you are your own person. You don't have to conform to any of those things. I feel like that is the biggest lesson that Pokemon and this series has taught me on this channel in a way. Or maybe I'm just reading too much into things and don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what the future of Pokemon on this channel looks like. But what I do know 
is that I would not have gotten this far if it wasn't for people like you. Like, I'm just some long-haired guy on the internet making videos. <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm doing a lot of the time. Like, it's been the past year that I've had to treat this channel way more seriously as it's grown, and I'm like, oh my goodness, how do I deal with this? Whoa! Like, it's mind-boggling to me that people are willing to, like, tune in here and spend time in these kinds of series and enjoy the kind of content that I'm putting out there when even I don't know what the heck I'm doing, you know? Like, it's absolutely, it's absolutely baffling to me in, like, the best possible way. Like, I've had some ups and downs in content creation. Heck, if my ramble up to this point with Pokemon alone didn't express that. There have definitely been some, some ups and downs in, <laughs> in my time with content creation. And there's been ups and downs in my life even before that point. Like, I grew up around a group that I felt invisible around a lot of the time. And I grew up, like with basically the same kind of group from all the way before kindergarten to grade 12 because of the German bilingual program that we were all in because there's only like a set of schools that had German bilingual in our city so I grew up with a with the same kind of group as I was expressing in the Germany stories video most likely in this series and like I have some good memories with them like the Germany stories and stuff but a lot of the time I would feel like like I wasn't there like I wasn't heard like, I started to worry that I was annoying to people, and I adopted this, like, very antisocial kind of personality where I'm a bit more like this in person, and I'll go sit in, like, the corner of the room and not really talk to anybody, and unless I'm, unless I'm spoken to, or I see that somebody needs help with something, and this is the kind of personality that I'll be, because I was worried that I was being annoying to people and that I'd scare them off, and I stopped talking and started being more like this, and I'd wait around in conversations for my chance to speak up, and... I'd get to maybe say one thing to add to a conversation like once a week and when I'd say that it would just be met with like a yeah uh, and then it'd go back to like whatever was said like a moment before even when I was trying my best to like add to a conversation and I I felt very out of place and that's kind of one of the main reasons why I started a channel in the first place like this was to go back to being like my true self, essentially. This super energetic person who <laughs> gets way too loud a lot of the time when I get like really passionate and excited about something and I just can't stop, can't stop talking about that. I just gotta express all these crazy things about it, you know? Like that's my true self. And making this channel became like my safe space to really be myself when I'm not in person being this antisocial kind of personality. I wasn't, really expecting that you know anything would be able to come of this i just felt like i'd be a a small streamer that had like nobody to maybe a few people every once in a while like forever and that's the way that things were going to be but now we're at the point where this channel is partnered now which is crazy enough as is and it's seeming like with enough time it's probably gonna hit 10k subs eventually here like maybe sometime next year and that's crazy to think about. It's like, uh, what? Huh? How did we get to whatever the number that we're even at right now is like the high 7,000s? Maybe it'll be above that by the time this is published because the whole daily upload schedule. But looking at that, it's like, this happened because I was my true self and that really resonated with people. So it's in a way really given me an epiphany of sorts that like, you know, maybe I, maybe I wasn't scaring people off as much as I thought I was with my true self. And that maybe there are people out there who are genuinely interested in seeing like my true passionate self. And that was kind of confirmed to me in a way as well, where a little while back on, on my university campus, I met up with some of those, some of the people that I grew up with at a, at a bar. And I, I never drink. I didn't have any alcohol there or anything like that. But we were just there for like some snacks and hanging out and stuff and catching up on, on old times. And... We eventually got to the topic of, like, some past mishaps and crazy things, and they started talking about, like, some of my old jokes, like, I was always a bit of a class clown and trying to make people laugh and all that fun stuff, trying to, trying to bring people enjoyment and smiles like I try to do with this channel, and they were laughing about some of these old antics of mine, and... They were saying like that was some of the funniest stuff they'd ever seen from before I developed my antisocial kind of personality, and... At first, I was a bit put off. I was like, oh, I thought you guys just thought I was being annoying with all that stuff. And they were like, nah, when you were speaking up, you were just funny until the end of time. And 
It took everything I had to not break down into tears in that bar that day. So, I feel like there's situations like that with <laughs> that group, or situations like this channel, where there's people who are willing to tune into a hundred part series like this on a 11 year old game or whatever the heck it is now. I'm losing track of time and see this long haired weirdo just be passionate and laugh and enjoy himself and all that crazy stuff. And it's, it's been fascinating in a way. So genuinely from the bottom of my heart, thank you for showing me that it's okay to be myself. And with that, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you enjoyed this series, and take care. See you.